Hi, this is Kara from the Special Needs Mom podcast. And this is Angela from Especially Organized, Sensible Solutions for Special Needs Moms. We have this heart for special needs moms. And so we thought, you know what, let's combine forces. And we have come up with what we're calling the purge party. And you can pretty much guess what it is. It's a party where we're going to come together and we're going to purge or in general, accomplish a goal, a small goal together. So we have set this for January 27th, starting at eight o'clock for my Pacific Coast people. Which means 11 o'clock for all of you on the East Coast. So this is an opportunity. If you have something on your to-do list that has just been stuck there and you are wanting to move it up on the list, you're wanting to tackle, maybe it's a space or an area of your home or a category in your home that has just needed a little time and attention. This is your opportunity for you to be online with us while you work and have access for us to help you answer your questions, help guide you and just serve you for those two hours. Yeah, exactly. And I think you can tell like what we've designed is just this very high level of support for that project that you just haven't been able to tackle on your own. The thing that we are envisioning is that you get to leave this purge party feeling so accomplished because you did the thing, you started the year off getting that thing done that you you were stuck on last year. And so it's a momentum builder, if you will. You can go ahead and sign up. We have a link ready for you. And we are offering this for $40 for the whole experience. Absolutely. And we hope you'll join us. I think it's going to be really fun. It's going to be a great group of moms of special needs kids. So we all get each other. We all have an understanding of what it's like to have something on our to-do list, but just we haven't been able to tackle it yet. So I hope that you will join us. We're super excited to bring this to you and we are thrilled to work with you. All right. We'll see you all there. Hi, I'm Kara, life coach, wife, and mom to four incredible and unique children. It wasn't all that long ago that my son received a diagnosis that had my world come crashing down. I lacked the ability to see past the circumstances, which felt impossible, and the dreams I once had for my life and family felt destroyed. Fast forward past many years of surviving and not at all thriving, and you'll see a mom who trusts that she can handle anything that comes her way and has access to the power and confidence that once felt so lacking. I created the Special Needs Mom podcast to create connection and community with moms who find themselves feeling trapped and with no one who really understands. My intention is to spark the flare of possibility in your own life and rekindle your ability to dream. This isn't a podcast about your special needs child. This is a podcast about you. If you are a mom who feels anxious, alone, or stuck, then you are in the right place. Welcome. Hello and welcome to the Special Needs Mom podcast and activation session with Isabel. Isabel is a mother to four children, ages eight, six, three, and 11 months. You will hear as we talk about the cornucopia of disabilities that her children have. You know, just hearing all that is on her plate, I can really, really understand why she might feel overwhelmed. Isabel shares with me before the episode that she was really looking to have better relationships, feel less overwhelmed, and not to feel so stuck and trapped. And one of the things that we uncovered during this session was really her relationship to anger and her recognition that she really is very angry and doesn't really have a, an ability to yet process that or really connect with that anger in a way that is productive for her. And when I say productive, I don't mean like it gets you somewhere. I really just mean that it allows her to process and to experience the impact of that anger. I know along my journey, my relationship to anger really had to be reinvented. Prior to all of the things that I've done as I became a coach and and ultimately started to coach this community, One of the most valuable things I think for me was really, really understanding the value of anger, recognizing that anger was not bad, recognizing anger was not dangerous, recognizing that anger could be a very powerful and connecting emotion. And 
also noticing the resistance that I had to being angry because a lot of narratives around being a woman who is angry in this society make us really want to resist that. And so many of the moms that I come across are also somewhere along this spectrum of being able to really own their anger. And there's something about a mom who gets in touch with her anger and actually embraces it and loves it as much as all the emotions that are fluffy and and pretty and perhaps feel easy. I just feel like there is so much power underneath that. And so I love intercepting a mom when she's like, yeah, I actually know I'm angry and yet I, I, I'm, I'm stuck still. And one of the reasons that we feel stuck is because we don't allow ourselves to feel the way we feel. And so it just brings me so much delight, which I know is kind of a weird word when we're talking about anger, delight to be able to connect a mom to the authentic experience that she's having. And it just unlocks it so much. Isabel was another mother who just brought so much authenticity and vulnerability to this session. And I loved her commitment. Her daughter was supposed to be napping, however, wasn't. So you will hear some a little squawks and squeaks in the background. And so hopefully they don't come across too loud, although I know the way that sometimes microphones pick it up, it might be louder. So forgive us for the little bit of noise in the background. But remember that you can do this work even while you're balancing a baby on your knees, which honestly is a really common experience. As I work with moms, they're just juggling all the things. I'm picturing one of the women in Pathway to Peace, and she was literally like walking around her house trying to manage her son who was not having it during the session. And yes, we had to take pauses. And yes, it was probably frustrating for her, but she got what she needed. And so I just love that commitment. Like, I won't let anything stop me, even this darling child who is committed to stopping me. You're going to love Isabel. Let's hear her session. Well, Isabel, welcome to your activation session. Thank you. And also, we should welcome your daughter who is with you. What is her name? Her name is Rose. Rose. So you all might hear Rose. She is so darling, chewing on something right now. So we over here, the Special Needs Mom podcast, we are flexible. So we work with what we have. This is a skill we all have to have in our lives as Special Needs Moms. So uh, pardon any background noise that you might hear. Isabel, tell me a little bit about um, just kind of a snapshot of your life, a quick description of the disabilities that you parent and just what you're experiencing on a day-to-day basis. Sure. We, I'm a mom of four. The oldest is almost eight. And she has they call it like atypical cerebral palsy. They don't know really what else to call it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) She doesn't have like spastic tone or anything like that. So it's kind of a weird description they give her. We also have Ehlers-Danlos. We have complex febrile seizures, abnormal EEGs, ADHD, Mm -hmm. autism, just like a global delay in dyspraxia. I think that's like the main for her she's got a, a couple other things that come along with it like the food allergies and the strabismus and things like that but they're kind of just part of the other diagnosis then our next boy lives with a reactive airway and an epileptic food allergy also has others down and I'm pretty sure he's twice exceptional so <laughs> we just haven't really pursued it yet mm-hmm. and the next one down is three and she has laryngomalacia, also part of the other stamos, but for the most part, she's mild right now. But as a baby, it was a little scary because her airway would collapse on itself. And so oh. we lived with six months of respiratory distress yeah. constantly. <laughs> and then this one just has a mild laryngomalacia. So hopefully that will be it. <laughs> and how old was your second oldest son? He is almost six. Six. Well, I have to say, wow. Wow. That is what I like to say, a cornucopia of diagnoses and just kind of watching you, the facial expression as you went through the list of all the diagnoses is kind of like you like scanning for all the different areas that you have diagnoses yeah. in. I might be forgetting some. It's so hard. I know. <laughs> yeah, ex- exactly. Like when, yeah. And that's exactly the experience that I had is like, there's so many that it's almost hard to keep track of them all. And then you have four children. Um, we're thinking we want them to have 
as much of a team, you know, to support each other as we possibly can. Yeah, that was a big part of my thinking as well, because I think, well, many of my listeners know that I was pregnant with my third son at the time of my second oldest son's diagnosis. So we were we were in. Then we did make the conscious choice to have our fourth child. And some people probably didn't understand that choice. But for us, I think our family only became more important for us. It made sense to, to grow our family, even though, yeah, it's more work. Okay. And you're married. Is that correct? Yes, I am. Awesome. And then do you, are you home with all these kids? Imagine. Yeah. For the most part, I'm a serial mom. I have a couple. So I've been working in a daycare for institution, but I'm stepping back now because I need to devote more attention to what our kids need right now. But yeah, for the most part, I do like side gigs here and there, but I'm just home. I just kind of do things on the side, raise four kids with all these things. It's not not a big deal. Um, I like the way that you describe that. So you've shared a little bit with me on your intake form about some areas you feel stuck, about some things that are happening right now. What I want you to do is I want you to fast forward six months from now and envision your life with all of the things handled or at least addressed to where you feel like, yeah, like I would be happy with that benchmark or feeling like there's progress. I think ideally, so we're going to have to homeschool our oldest daughter it's just not working out in the public school right now, which makes me think I might pull out my other son too, because I'm having a hard time, I think, with a massive to-do list. So I feel like I spend most of my time in the car and driving people to school and to therapies and like trying to conform to seven different teams of people's schedules who need me to be in various different places all throughout the day. So I think I'd love to be able to pull them back and just get into somewhat of a routine in which I'm actually able to be present to them. I think I've been kind of escaping from being with them. I mean, like I'm here with them, but mm-hmm. I'm like escape into scrolling or listening to podcasts or calling a million doctors or researching what therapy or what medicine to use. Not that it is bad, but it's almost like a form of escapism. Like I'm just not really engaging with them and being present to them in a real way in some ways I feel like if I'm not constantly on and doing things I'm going to forget about something really important and it is easier to just jump into my list of to-dos and worries in my head (laughs) than sitting down to be with them so I'd love to pull them back and just be able to be present with them doing that school with them and just doing like our own family life and schedule instead of constantly drowning on a to-do list and other people's schedules <laughs> that they put on our family. <laughs> yeah. I can picture this reversal where right now you're at the impact of everybody else's schedule. And I almost picture you in your, whatever vehicle you drive, like literally kind of trying to navigate all this, which I know how this feels and having no control, but you're saying is like, I'm going to pull back and actually I'm going to create this place where people can come into And I'm not the one that's frantically running about trying to get everywhere to meet other people's needs. Beautiful. All right. So we have this vision of you having this space in your home where you're more able to meet your kids' needs. And a byproduct of that would be meeting your own needs. Tell me more. You picture this six months from now. Everybody's at home. Everybody's receiving schooling and perhaps therapies at home. What else do you picture if all of the things are handled? just want to be able to like clean my house and cook and enjoy time and like be able to set in in different corners so like some of them are reading for part of the day somebody is taking a nap and things like that so I can just have some time alone care for the house and (laughs) I also have a little photography business which I have not been doing a lot with so I'd love to do that a little bit more again and really more than anything just being able to laugh with them and read to them again. With the pandemic and everything, we were homeschooling forever and I really loved it. And I was able to do crafts and hands-on projects with them. But then I got so overwhelmed with everybody's needs and therapies. I mean, sometimes I have like seven therapists a week on top of me telling me how to parent, <laughs> and putting mm-hmm. me in multiple different directions and, you know, having to do all the exercises. I wasn't able to do any of what I liked doing with my kids, which was like, crafts and homeschooling 
And instead I was doing all this other stuff to the point where I just really burnt out after that period, even though we started outsourcing school and therapies again, like I just didn't have it in me to sit down and like color with my kids anymore. Like I was just so tapped out that I couldn't mm-hmm. even do the things I wanted to do with them, you know? Yeah. I can totally picture that. It's like you were already giving everything that you had. And what we know is having fun and enjoying from um, when our needs are not met is really, it's like walking uphill. Well, that doesn't sound that hard. (laughs) It's like, (laughs) let me come up with a better example. It's doing something really hard. Let's just leave it there. (laughs) The way that you pictured and were describing, I hear that you want calm. You want calm in your home. Like this, the way that you navigate from the different spaces, the way of being that I heard you describing is just very calm, calm and, and organized and planned and really in charge which then creates a an easier structure for then you to to ease into the laughter and to the play and to the parts that you probably had dreamed of as becoming a mom. Okay, beyond what you've already shared, what do you feel like are the biggest obstacles keeping you from that right now? I think some of it is practical because we're still in school right now and we still have a million therapies to get to. Some of it is just me though like I am having such a hard time it's like I want to be present with them and I just I just can't <laughs> I just feel so like I can't sit down to be with them. <laughs> and I don't know what it is I think I was just so burnt out of this I haven't found a way to get out of that okay thank you for sharing that so I want you to picture yourself in a moment maybe even today where perhaps you would have had the opportunity to, to play and to be present, but you didn't, you chose not to. I want you just to describe what happens for you in that moment. Can you think of a moment where that happened recently? Yeah. (laughs) Okay. So describe the experience. So for example, I'll put the big two, um, either drop them off and put them on the bus and then come inside and like really intend to just spend time with my three-year-old. but. Instead, I get a phone call from, you know, like a doctor or something. So then I just like go take the phone call or start doing scheduling or look at my to-do list. And I start just managing my kids away from me. So it's like I start finding things for them to do away from me mm-hmm. so that I can just do the things that I either feel like I need to do or would rather do. And before I know it, it's like once I do one thing, the rest of the day kind of gets into that habitual pattern of like okay well you're done with moon sand why don't you go like swing for a sec and I'll be inside cleaning the kitchen and I'll just look at you from in here and then you know they'll come in and be like okay well this is a great time for you to watch an episode or something while I make lunch and then we'll eat lunch and then somebody will call during lunch and I'm talking to the doctor so then before I know it it's the whole day has passed it's time to go get the next kiddo and I haven't even done anything with my kids you know <laughs> totally I think we all know how long those calls take and how much energy they take, actually. Ultimately, what I hear is that there is a comfort in doing and a discomfort in playing anything other than doing. I guess we could put it that way. Yeah. So if we put words to it, what do you think the payoff is for you in all of the doing? What do you get out of that? I think some of it is just their satisfaction in finishing tasks. Mm. <laughs> it feels nice to get something done, especially if it's not just about to get on done <laughs> because somebody's going mm. to do something. But some of it too, it's like, I just, there's so much going on in my head that it's just hard to snap out of it. So I'm just thinking and I'm just feeling and I am so much more preoccupied with what's going on inside of me than what's going on around me in my house. <laughs> Yeah. It's like, I can very much just picture the experience. It's almost like there's so much energy in the swirling thoughts. There's so much consumption there that of course there's no ability. Actually, I want to really recognize that you in those moments, I would say that you don't actually have the ability to sit and play. It's not accessible to you. And so I think the work here for you is to really look at what you need to do to, I would actually say self-regulate to really regulate your system down. Cause really what's happening is your nervous system is so activated. So it's in this kind of hyper aroused state. 
And it's really happy to be doing stuff because it feels like if I do stuff, I'm going to be safe, which is not true, even though I would agree that it is satisfying to get stuff done. I want you to equate the doing stuff is also a way that your nervous system is staying safe. It thinks this is safe. I can keep my kids safe. I can be safe. I don't have to deal with the variability of what's going to happen with my kids. I get stuff done, which I think is important to be safe too. You're nodding. So it yeah. seems like. So I think it's important to mention that because I am a big proponent of thought work, really looking at the thoughts we have, our thoughts determine our feelings, and those ultimately create our actions and then our, our you know result. However, if we don't first regulate our nervous system, we won't be able to access that. Like it's not accessible to us. And so the first thing, the step for you, I think, is in regulating and actually doing what you need to do to get yourself down from this swirly spinning state. And I'm actually, I'm pointing to my head because I feel like this all happens in your head. Not that you don't have a physical experience, but it's like, I feel like the energy is very head-based. And so ultimately it's like, we're shifting the energy to kind of ground you and to slow you down, to actually tell yourself that you're safe and to see then what's accessible for you then. Yeah. All right, I want to map this back to the evolution of the special needs mom, which is just kind of a framework that I use to describe where we are so we can help get to the next step, if you will. Even though um, I want to make sure that it's clear that it's like, if you're at any point in the stage, it doesn't mean you're in the wrong stage. <laughs> it just means that's where you're at. And by moving to the next stage, it's just the opportunity that we have to get to know ourselves better and to live a little bit more um, from a place of intention and desire versus kind of impact of what's happening to us. What I'm going to pinpoint on is that likely because of this one-sidedness with you putting all of your energy into managing, and that's very control-based, which is very fear-based, that this puts you in the, the second stage, which is what I call stable yet self-sacrificing. And I think you're at that place where like to get to the next step is actually saying, Ugh, like, I don't want this anymore. I see that this is ultimately not the best way to help my kids because I think you are very, one, you want to have the experience with yourself, but you also probably see the impact of a mom that is not present for their kids. So I think it's like you see both sides of it. Does that sound accurate with kind of what I'm describing? Yeah. And I feel like I've been there for years. I just can't get out of it. I mean, I think probably our hardest year was 2019 to 2020, but I think it's been really long and drawn out because at first, like nobody even believed me something was wrong with my kids. <laughs> so it took so much fighting with every doctor and, you know, trying to sort through like, how do you tell family <laughs> that this is going on when family just would rather be in denial about it. <laughs> But like, how do you tell your friends and like your friends can't really understand and everybody just jumps in trying to be kind, you know, but to tell you that like, no, every kid is clumsy. I'm like, no, it's probably nothing. And she'll probably outgrow it. And it's really not a big deal. Kind of thing. So it was like a lot of fighting in the beginning, a lot of being overwhelmed. All of a sudden in 2020, maybe 2019, right before the pandemic, it got really, really crazy because it was like, we have one kiddo with special needs that now it's kind of obvious. And then number three is born and like, we didn't know. Now we have another kid who also can't get sick, who can't breathe, <laughs> you know? And then a couple months later, my second had its first anaphylactic reaction. So we were like, okay, now the third kid also <laughs> needed an ambulance. So it's still a lot of fighting and fighting and fighting and fighting and fighting. And I think my coping mechanism was just escaping. So like as soon as my husband would get home, I would just give him the kids and leave. <laughs> I was like, I just can't deal with this anymore. But since then, I've been trying to break out of that where it's like, now we have diagnosis. Now nobody has any doubt that anything is going on. But I'm still stuck in this, like I have to fight mode, even though I'm yeah. not fighting as much <laughs> anymore. You know, <laughs> Really, really, really great. I'm so glad that you gave us a picture because that is exactly what happens. When we don't effectively process our emotion, it does literally get stuck in us. It gets stagnant. And I find that if you have not learned to practice, well, even if you have learned, because I'll say, I know how to do all this. And that doesn't mean that everything's always perfectly processed. We as human beings 
have thoughts and feelings about feelings, and sometimes we avoid them. So that's just kind of how it is. And when we haven't really learned this skill, because I actually want to identify it as a skill of processing our emotion, then it's kind of like every once in a while, you'll have ex- feelings exploding out of you. You feel out of control. I do feel a little bit out of control with what's going on inside where it's just like, I'm so stuck in like fighting and I am so stuck in feeling different from everybody around us. And I think in some levels, like at first there was a lot of grief from it and a lot of fighting, fighting, fighting. And I think the grief has subsided, even though it does occasionally hit me because like you say there's like a moment before and a moment after like I think of the person before any of the seizures began where I was like that person doesn't exist Mm -hmm. I probably won't exist anymore but I think I'm more stuck in like an angry face now where it's like I just I'm fighting and fighting and fighting with people for like years to get diagnosis and IEP teams and you know just like a whole a lot of people <laughs> I just guess I need to fight and then on top of it is the more personal relationships in which family and friends or just acquaintances would rather pretend like what's going on isn't going on so I feel like all of my reactions are anger which is yeah bad. I'm like so angry at what I see my friends do or something and I mean I'm not angry like I don't dislike my friends and I'm like oh yeah life is that simple you know like I'm pretty cynical in general mm-hmm. it's no wonder <laughs> well no I, and I totally get that and I think when we have anger and any emotion unprocessed it does sneak out and so for you it sneaks out in a little bit more judgment um, and cynicism I'll just say when we haven't made peace with certain parts of our life then we do this thing called comparing And we look at other people's lives and we say, we have it worse than them, or I shouldn't feel so bad because they have it worse than us, right? So I'm sure you could find somebody that in your vision has it worse than you to try to help yourself a little bit better, which maybe helps a teeny, teeny, teeny bit, but ultimately it's not a, not a good solution. And so I think the thing that I want to invite you to is to really process this emotion. And I will give you tools offline. I won't go over them today, but I'll make sure you have several options. And the way, actually, I had this idea yesterday, actually, and it was in the area of anxiety because this week, um, I'm just really focusing on my own anxiety because we have a lot of stuff happening this week. And I just noticed my nervous system was like, whoa, we are not okay. (laughs) But it happens in all sorts of subtle ways. It's not like telling you, Kara, I have anxiety. It's more like, I think I'm having a heart attack yesterday. That was my, I was like, I think I'm having a heart attack when I was driving. (laughs) because my hands were like a little bit numb, (laughs) but don't worry. I didn't have a heart attack. Okay. Processing emotions. Our body will tell us what's going on. And when you learn to really connect with your body, it is so, um, what word will I use for this? It feels, I guess, so hopeful because what's happened for you, I think, is you really disconnected. And that is, that is, I want to point out, is a survival technique. And it's been a very effective one for you because guess what? You survived. You are here. You got through all of the, the awful moments that you had to just get through. And so your body did a wonderful thing by just isolating you from actually feeling the feelings and being able to process it. And so now is the time that things are stable enough. You, like you said, you have the diagnoses, you kind of have a vision for what you're going to do for school because you know it's not working. And so now's the point where I think what I hear is that you're trying to kind of complete the process. Like you are um, intellectually aware that you want to do something else. You want to have a different experience, but your body is on a different page and our body always wins. So the work for you, I think, starts with physiologically processing the emotion and getting really good at paying attention to your body and having that be an indicator for you of what you need, because your body is going to tell you what you need. So I was thinking, oh my gosh, it'd be kind of fun to put all the different ways, all the different tools that I use or other people use to process any given emotion, anger or anxiety, and almost cross off the bingo squares, like trying them all out because What works for one person doesn't necessarily work for another. And what works for you one day doesn't necessarily work for you the next day. And so bingo was like the picture I had almost just as having a spirit of experiment with it. And so what I'll give you is I won't have a full bingo set, although 
you know, hashtag goals, but I will give you options to choose from to engage with your body and process your emotions, specifically anger. Once I give you the menu, are you willing to take on at least one of the exercises within a week of when you receive it? Yeah. Okay. So that is what I will hold you accountable to. And obviously we'll do that offline. Any thoughts or questions about what we've talked about or what you're going to be taking on? No, that sounds great. I feel like because I've, I've gone to counseling for like five years trying to deal with like the anxiety and PTSD over, mm-hmm. you know, like all this stuff. I never seem to get the follow-ups like dealing with the actual emotions. It's like I can understand a lot of what's going on. We've done EMDR to take like, the edge off and stuff. And mm-hmm. It's great, but it's like just <laughs> never leaving. <laughs> it's constantly there, you know, so... Yeah. And I'm so glad that you've taken on counseling. I think it could be so helpful. And I, again, like with a bingo analogy, I think counseling and therapy is one of those boxes. And it is a place where often we can learn the skills. So I'm so glad that you've taken that on. This is just looking at it from a another angle, if you will. The other thing I want to mention here, um, because you mentioned the grief and you've started the grief process And oftentimes I think we think of therapy and grief, and that's kind of where we do that work. And I would agree that we certainly can do grief work in therapy. And the thing I would put in for you is recognizing that grief is intended to be done in community, that actually we as a body, a body of people long to be together in grieving, that having our grief witnessed by a compassionate and loving community is something that allows us to process it to accept it, to incorporate it into our life as both a joy and a sorrow and to really kind of have a place for it so it can settle and find a home, you know, the thing that we're grieving. So I would also suggest perhaps looking at community and saying, okay, what's a community where I can lean into the grief, to the connection, to the understanding and with people that are also on their path to to being present? And figuring out how to address their own needs so that they can be present for other people. Okay. Well, thank you so much for sharing. And thank you so much for this conversation and for making it work, even with your daughter on your lap. She did so good, by the way. She was singing, but hopefully it doesn't come across too loud on the microphone. Um, But I'm glad she was generally happy. All right. I will see you over on email. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you. One more thing before we officially, officially wrap up this show. Sometimes when I'm listening to podcasts, I have the experience of wanting more. I'm listening at the very end thinking, I sure wish that episode didn't end. I invite you, if you feel in any way the same way, I invite you to the Special Needs Mom podcast community, which is a free group that I host on Facebook, where we as a community of fellow moms who listen to this podcast and are experiencing life in similar shoes, get to talk to one another, get to share stories, get to actually interact. I hope you'll consider joining. See you over there.